I've never spoken after my buddy Deborah Deb. Um, so I'm, I'm actually thrilled to be doing that today. I, I want to start first of all by saying it would be wrong for me not to start my comments by first acknowledging that today, four billion people around the world were watching a funeral of a 96-year-old woman who ran an institution that enslaved people and colonized people. At the same time, three million people in the, in the, in the, on the island of Puerto Rico are living without electricity. So as we have this wonderful conversation about anti-racism our, in our own institutions, including here at the amazing BU and at Rutgers and other places, let's keep in mind that ultimately the work that we're doing at this level is about the people who are affected every single day. Right, and so my thoughts and prayers out to the people in Puerto Rico, and we have to continue to put up that, that fight, um, that good fight. How do I relate to this work? Well, I, I have a little summary that I'm not gonna read to you, but you can read it for yourself while I have it up there, but while I tell you that over the course of the last five years, I've been in this role as Dean of the School of Public Health, and I could say to you that five years ago when I was at another institution where my friend Deborah is now, this work would have been easier it is much more challenging in my current institution. And so my relationship to developing anti-racist policies at the Rutgers School of Public Health is in part shaped by this institution that I've landed in. And I'm actually loving it. Like, I'm a Piagetian, I believe in disequilibrium. I believe that you know you grow when you push yourself and you think widely. And then over the course of the last five years, I've had to learn how to think widely in a way that I didn't have to think about that before. Number two, I've had the great privilege over the course of the last few years as a representative at the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health to develop two really critical documents that we uh, around uh, racism and discrimination. First, I think it was 2019, I don't know in what year we're in anymore. Is it like 1952? I have no idea where we are. But in 2019, I think, we put out a, a, a document on anti on uh, discrimination and harassment in schools of public health that was published in Public Health Reports where we began to think through what do we need to do in, as institutions to fight those conditions that shape our schools and our programs. And then with my dear friend Linda Alexander, over the course of the last couple of years, developed a set of strategies and recommendations, long, long medium, and short term, for developing anti-racist policies and anti-racist procedures and curricula um, at schools and programs of public health. And if you haven't seen that, that's available at the ASPPH website. And over the course of the next few years, we'll be working with all the institutions to figure out what we're all doing, because each of us is doing something. None of us is doing everything, right? And some of us are doing some things very well, and some of us are doing other things very well, and how can we learn from each other? So I come to this work also as, you know, as, as it says at the bottom of my, um, sli uh, of my slide there, you know, as a, as a white man, right, as a white gay man who thinks he can pass a straight, I don't really know if I can pass a straight or not. I think I'm so gay. Um, but, you know, <laughs> But, but as this white man of, with, with who, who came from this immigrant family but, uh, and who, who struggled, but at the end of the day, my struggle was the struggle of a white man. And that was a very different kind of struggle. And if I don't own that, and if I don't say that, and if I don't do that in front of you, then shame on me for doing that. And that's what I do every single day in my position at the Rutgers School of Public Health. I don't have the answers um, for how we're gonna change our institutions, but I, I come back to this really important point. Why do we need anti-racist institutional policies? Because people's health and well-being is being adversely affected. And I just have up there for you three snapshots. First, or monkeypox, or which I like to call orthopox 59. Orthopox, fi orthopox 59, which as you see is manifesting, not surprisingly, differently across race, both in terms of infection and in vaccination. The next picture over there, maternal mor mortality, which manifests differently across race also in our, in our country. And last but not least, the immigration crisis in our country, where people are being trafficked and shipped from southern states up to your state and, others, and, to, my, and to my home city of New York. This is why we're doing the work. This is why we need anti-racist institutions. This is why we need anti-racist policies at our schools to develop a set of scholars, researchers, practitioners, advocates, and activists at our institutions that go out there and, and fight these realities. But we cannot do this work unless we check ourselves and, 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 deal, with the anti, and, and deal with the racist ways of our own institutions. So, how do I do this work? And I'm just gonna leave you with my perspective. Oh, and this is that, I don't know. So CDC finally realizes that too. 
then maybe they should be doing actually work for people. As I said when I first got to Rutgers, we do public health work, public. Not behind the computer, a little behind the computer, but mostly in the public, right? And I, I'm really proud to say that the school has evolved into that over the course of the last five years. And this op-ed that I wrote in The Hill is really about, about that idea of how we keep public service and public interest at the center. So to me, the way I continue to challenge this every single day at my institution, and my institution exists, my school, our school exists within the structure of a biomedical health science institute that is often directed by MDs, no disrespect, Sandro, by MDs, um, often white, often male, cis, and heterosexual. And so that's my reality that I'm dealing with. So how do I try to convey to them we need to think about policies that give an equal chance to everybody? Well, I frame it around this idea of inclusive excellence. The idea that excellence is not just one thing. It is many things. It can manifest in many different ways. And for me, the inspiration for a lot of this happened in 2007 when I read this report by ETS of all, of all places that wrote a report called the, the Perfect Storm, right? And in that, in that, in that report, they discussed the, on, the ongoing shifts that were going on in our country, both in terms of the demography of our country, but also the literacy of people and the skills that we needed for, from, from future workers. And they said very like, Foretellingly, is that a verb? Is that a, is an adverb? Foretellingly, foretellingly, it's going to be now. Um, if we maintain our present policies, we will likely continue to grow apart with greater inequity in wages and wealth and increasing social and political polarization. Uh, yeah, things like we're there right now, right? And it's because we haven't really addressed these things. And I, I raise these for you because I think one of the challenges we have at our institutions is to address those three bullets up, up, up on top. Number two, the idea of inclusive excellence, which is, of course, has been developed for, for colleges and universities to think about student learning, to me, has an equal application when we think about faculty. Our students cannot, cannot excel if our faculty do not excel. Number, next idea, inclusive excellence requires that we define excellence at our institutions in many different ways. My challenge every single day is to argue that we cannot have people, teachers in different, uh, faculty members in different buckets. That in fact, everybody has a portfolio. A portfolio that sometimes is more scholarship and sometimes is more pedagogy. And that each of us has this portfolio. And that each of these pieces that constitute our pie contribute to who we are and what we provide to our institution. So putting people in separate types of faculty lines doesn't really help that, right? What it does is it others people who are not on a tenure track line, right? And often those people who are not on a tenure track line are people of color. They go into the teaching line because, you know, there's not, they're not as good as the people on the, on, the, on the tenure track line. And that's a reality that I face every single day. The other thing that we have to think about when we think about inclusive excellence is having a faculty that is diverse, but not just diverse in terms of race and ethnicity, absolutely. Diverse in terms of the populations that we serve, in terms of the students that we teach, in terms of the disciplines involved in public health work. I think we all remember that public health came together with a variety of disciplines coming at this intersectional crossroad. Like I'm a psychologist and an epidemiologist and an activist and an educator. We were not just one thing and I think we've lost that a little bit, that, that, that richness of public health that we need to relive. And then the diversity of the scholarly work that exists in public health, right? So one of, the th one of the challenges I think I have every single day in my life also is fighting this idea that somebody is a good scholar only if they have a large H index, right? And it's more than just somebody's H index. That was supposed to be like a joke. You were supposed to fill in the blank there. <laughs> I don't have a majorly gay audience, that's why. <laughs> um, the other thing is the need to uplift voices. Um, and, 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 and finally, I think this is my last slide, the way we assess excellence has to be multidimensional. And you know, I spent some time in a classroom teaching children when I was doing my doctorate, which was amazing. Yes, Lin-Manuel Miranda was actually in my class, that's correct. You can talk to me about that later. Um, <laughs> it's like my claim to fame, right? Um, but in fact, e as we think about how we assess excellence, 
it's really, it's an, it, this is a critical element because that is tied directly to how we evaluate people and the values we keep on what actually matters. And excellence has to be defined in this multi-dimensional way. And I think you're all familiar with the Murray book from like 1994, if you haven't read it, which is like if you have an IQ, you do well. And if you have an IQ, you're probably Asian but not black. And it's just a mess, that book. And then Howard Gardner's really beautiful multiple intelligence theory, which I keep very close to my heart. Because everybody has some intelligence in some way, right? Like, so I have like high mathematical intelligence, but don't ask me to sing. Right? Um, and then last but not least, um, inclusive excellence requires that we address discrimination in the tenure and promotion process. So if we continue to have this unitary definition of what excellence is like and what a tenured faculty member looks like, then we're not going to diversify both the skill set that is present in our school, in our, in, our, in our schools, in our universities, in our classrooms, and the type of people who we attract. Diversification and inclusion does not mean lowering of standards. I have spent the last several years having this fight that no, I'm not trying to lower standards. I'm not going like this, we're trying to go like this. And I think we all have to figure out a way to embrace this more holistic way of thinking about excellence in academia. This most holistic way of thinking about excellence will naturally be tied to anti-racist, anti-homophobic, anti-women policies that exist at all of our institutions and you know that they're there. And ultimately, we will get to a place that we're actually, our universities and our institutions look like the people we are trying to actually, lives we're trying to improve. You can find me there on the Twitter and on the other thing, wherever I am. Thank you very much for, uh, for, for indulging me.